Good evening. This is Ram from the World Yoga Festival and welcome to the last day, day 15 of our 15 day meditation challenge. At nine o'clock every evening, you join me here, calm and collected, just for half an hour of contemplation before working yourself gently to bed. And as we conclude, one of the things that we must discuss before we leave is why do it? What are the benefits of gaining this knowledge and making this knowledge your own through meditation? As you recall, when we began, we said that the human motive was the same for everyone. Despite all that they're engaged in, people are seeking eternal happiness. They know what eternal happiness might look like because in their lives, everybody has little moments of absolute joy when all other thoughts are banished from their mind. What they want to do is recreate that moment on a more permanent basis. We said that the Vedas recognized that this is what humans wanted to do and therefore provided us with mechanisms in order to achieve so. And the first thing that it, to remember, first thing we discussed was the fact that Human beings have, should have four goals in life. Dharma, which is ethics. All things that we should do should be done ethically. Artha, karma, and moksha. Artha is security, financial or otherwise. Karma is desire, entertainment. And moksha is liberation. Liberation from what? Liberation from samsara, the ups and downs of life. What's called sukha and dukkha. Sukha means happiness, dukkha means unhappiness. The ups and downs of life that we go through, that's samsara. And people don't want that. People want it to be permanently happy. The first three of these, an ethical lifestyle, uh, security and entertainment can be achieved through our ethical actions and effectively by teaching ourselves to be good people and with ethical and moral laws we can achieve the first three in practically enormous quantity without harming others and life is meant to be enjoyed in that way. But the fourth one, moksha, unlimited happiness, cannot be achieved through action. We need to understand that this happiness or ananda, sometimes translated as bliss, is our true nature. So you say, okay, if ananda is our true nature, and it is, in fact, infinite, I would want to get into infinite ananda, please. It's called nitya ananda. I would like a bit of that, please. And in that request is the reason why you can never have it. Because eternal ananda cannot be acquired by somebody who thinks that they do not have it. Because if you don't have it, you want it to start. And anything that is eternal has no beginning. It's a logical flaw. You cannot have something that is eternal thinking that you're non-eternal in the first place. So effectively, what we're looking at is realizing that any of the sadhanas, any of the practices that we perform cannot get us to this ananda, 
this unlimited happiness. The only way to do it is to realize that we're already there. That is already our nature. To do that, to come to that realization, we must remove ignorance. Ignorance that we are already uninterrupted, unending happiness. We've already said that we are pure consciousness, Jit, and we are the basis, the underlying reality of the world, Sat. And therefore, Sat, Jit, and Ananda becomes a way of describing our very nature. Once we come to realize but this is our nature. There are a number of benefits. And what would be the earthly point of studying all of this if there weren't some benefits? And the benefits are really threefold. The first is through this knowledge, we can destroy what's called the knot of ignorance certainly destroy ignorance. What is the knot of ignorance? The knot of ignorance is that which, like a knot, binds. And a knot, the our ignorance knot, has been around a long time. Not only in this life, but in past lives. So this is a very hard knot to pick. What does this knot tie together? Because knots invariably tie two things together. This knot ties the dives, what I consider to be me, Atma, and what I consider to be not me, Anatma. If you like, the seer and the seen, the knower and the known. These two I have tied together and called it me. This is the ignorance, and this is the knot that this knowledge helps unpick. The second benefit is destruction about the doubts about this teaching. As I've said before, this is a matter for knowing, not a matter for believing. Because for believing, teaching isn't required. Knowing comes from understanding. Believing comes from faith. Vedanta is not a faith requiring preaching, it's knowledge requiring teaching. In Vedanta, the student is encouraged to ask questions, since the teaching seems to be totally contradictory to my experience. Seems to be completely contradictory to my experience as we've gone through it. Vedanta teaches us about three things. Jiva, myself, Jagat, the world, and Ishwara, God. The first teaching is that you are infinite, all-pervading, immortal, now, every experience that I have has proved to me throughout my life my limitation. Yet Vedanta shockingly says that you are the whole. I always thought I was the person that knew most about myself. And Vedanta comes in and says, you are actually immortal. You do not know your true underlying nature. All my life, I believe that Ishvara, or God, is somewhere, that I am a pure, simple devotee at his feet. And one day, if I'm very good and do all the right things, and he wants me to, I will merge with him. And Vedanta says, that Ishvara, that God, you are. This is the second unbelievable thing that we're taught. 
Finally, the Shastra says, there's no such thing as the world. And if at all there is something there, a concession, if you like, to appease us, it says it is unreal. And in a statement, caps it off in something that seems completely unbelievable and says, the eternal, invisible Brahman is the only reality and the changing visible world is unreal. The external invisible Brahman is the only reality and the changing visible world is unreal. Therefore, I can't accept the teachings of Vedanta about myself, about Ishwara and the world based on my experience. Yet there is no Vedantic teaching apart from this. With clear knowledge, I should understand and be convinced about these three aspects of the Shastra. I don't need to convince others. I just need to be convinced myself. And once I'm convinced, it matters little to me whether the world is convinced or not. The third thing, therefore, is that there's a benefit in the exhaustion, and this is a more technical one, of all the karmas. If I'm no longer associated with the ego, the doer, which is a property of the mind, then I'm not responsible for the actions because the actions were done by the doer and the consequences, the karma phalam, punya and papa, belong to the doer. Therefore, the karmic actions of agami karma, which is the consequences of actions performed while living, and sanchita karma, the karma phalam that is accumulated over lifetimes, are dissolved. What we're left with is pravda karma, the karmic results with which we were born. And this lifetime was designed to exhaust them. That continues, and you could say, what is the benefit of having all this teaching if I still have to go through the sukha dukkha, the happiness and the unhappiness associated with the prayer of the karma with which I was born? And the answer lies in your attitude. In your attitude, to those things. They're still there. What is the benefit? The benefit is peace of mind. Your peace of mind is no longer dependent upon favorable or unfavorable conditions. It's not dependent on external favorable or unfavorable outcomes. The external world cannot determine your peace of mind. You have now developed a raincoat. It may rain, but you have protection. You won't get wet. You won't be able to stop the rain. That's just the weather. Life will have its ups and downs, but you now have the protection to not be affected by them. Let's go into meditation. I've become really good at this now. You can settle down in the blink of an eye. Just a request to sit down and relax, to be totally grounded and feel the life force within you. And the gratitude that you're alive 
with all of your faculties. Focusing on the breath. The thoughts are diminished. Let them pass you by. You have come to know you are much greater than the sum of your parts. In fact, the underlying nature of you is no different to the underlying nature of the whole universe. of other people or even Ishwara. There is no difference. Sat, Chit, Ananda is your intrinsic nature. And thus you are complete, whole, all pervading, boundaryless, immortal.
with Sanchita karma destroyed, Agami karma avoided, and Prabhda karma detoxified, the knowledgeable one, Niyani, is called a Jivan Mukti, one who has attained moksha while living, Jivan Mukti. For her, her body, mind and intellect is an ornament and life is a play and no karmas can cause harm. For a Jivan Mukti, all fear is eradicated. And the greatest of our fears is death. But there is no death for a yami. Because we were never born. Our bodies may come and go. But we are here forever. Eternal. Immortal. With all fear gone, I can live the life without taking heed of what it might do to me. I can live for others so that they too may come to this understanding and attain eternal happiness. I have come to know that Brahman is both the cause and the effect. Clay in the form of a lump is called clay, while in another form it is called pot. Clay is the cause, pot is the effect. So from one perspective, Brahman is called the cause, while from another, Brahman is called the effect. Brahman with unmanifest name and form 
is the cause. Brahman, with manifest name and form, is called the effect. In short, whether it is the cause or the effect, everything is Brahman. Aham Brahmasmi, that Brahman I am. Let's bring our hands together. Say, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Very good. Thank you so much for being here all this time. 15 days is not easy to do. And you should congratulate yourself on making it through the 15 days. I hope that it has helped a little bit to bring a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of peace, and perhaps even occasional night of sleep. 
stay well. Remember, everything that comes must also go. So whatever you're going through now, this too shall pass. And I know that everybody's going through quite a bit at this moment. So take care of yourselves. Thank you. If I see you on a future class, it'll be lovely to have you there. Well done, everybody. Good night. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you.